Hey everyone, welcome back once again to Control System Laboratories. This is a continuation video on how to read a gyro data sheet. This is part two, so if you missed part one, you should probably check that one out first before watching this video. But uh, we've got a lot of information to cover, so enough talking, let's just jump right in. We left off talking about the mechanical characteristics of the gyro and explaining what each of these parameters mean and how they could affect or impact your system design. So let's move on to the electrical characteristics. Now the min IMU9 takes care of supplying the correct voltage and current to this gyro at the component level. So if you're trying to hook up power to the min IMU9, then you'd be better off reading the electrical characteristics of that board rather than here. However, I want to just briefly explain a few of these parameters so you have an idea of what to look for when selecting a sensor at the component level. The supply voltage is the voltage that you must provide to the gyro in order for it to operate. This gyro runs at a typical voltage of 3 volts. However, you can supply anywhere from 2.4 to 3.6 volts and the gyro will still work. The supply current is the amount of current this device will draw when operating. So you need to compare the voltage and current of the sensor against the supply capability of your system. For example, if you're using an Arduino Uno board to drive this sensor, then you would hook it up to the 3.3 volt supply. However, that can only supply 50 milliamps of current, which is more than enough for this sensor, but if you start to design a system that uses multiple components on the 3.3 volt line, you'll need to be sure you're not trying to draw more than 50 milliamps. Alternatively, you could supply the voltage using external batteries and a switch, like a transistor, a typical AA battery is about 1.5 volts, so you'll need two batteries in series to generate the 3 volts needed. Or you could generate the 3 volts from more or less batteries using a step-up or step-down voltage converter. Now I don't want to go into how to design all of these systems. I just want to state them so you have an idea of how the electrical characteristics of your sensor could drive the design of your system. The more you're aware of how your components operate, then the better your design can be up front and less work you'll have to do later on. So let's move on to the next section. We talked a little bit about the temperature sensor in the last video, so I'll just hit the highlights here. The temperature sensor is a nice feature to have built into your gyro, because if you want to operate your sensor in a dynamic temperature environment, then you'll want to know what the temperature is at the gyro, so you can compensate for the changes in the mechanical characteristics digitally. If your operating environment is fairly constant, or if you don't require extreme precision in the gyro reading, and you don't need to worry about the temperature sensor. And that brings us to the communication interface. This gyro is capable of sending and receiving data over two different bus protocols, SPI, or Serial Peripheral Interface, and I2C, or Inter IC Interface. I'm going to skip over much of this section because most of the time you won't need to write your own communication interface, especially if you're using an open source hardware platform like the Arduino, where there's free libraries online to do this very thing. The Application Hints section explains some of the external components you'll want to add to your design if you're developing your own PCB that uses this gyro. For example, this 10 nanofarad capacitor, C1, needs to be in line between pin 14 and ground. Again, if you're using min IMU9, then Polalu has already built this into their board and you don't need to worry about it. You can see the schematic of the min IMU9 board on the Polalu website. And here you can see that they have that 10 nanofarad capacitor between pin 14 and ground, just like the application hints said. Okay, let's go back to the data sheet and we'll continue. In the block diagram figure, you can see that this particular gyro has a first in, first out buffer, or FIFO. And there are five modes for this buffer bypass mode, FIFO mode, stream mode, bypass to stream mode, and stream to FIFO mode. Now in order to determine what this means to you as the system designer, let's go to the blackboard. A buffer is an area of memory that is set aside to temporarily store data so that you can access it and move it later. The buffer in this particular gyro allows you to save 32 16-bit readings for each of the three axes, X, Y, and Z. When you operate the buffer in bypass mode, then the angular velocity data is not stored in the buffer and the system acts like the buffer is not even there. This is the default setting on the gyro. Let me explain a little bit more what that means to you. 
Let's say that you had a gyro that you set up to give you readings every 5 hertz, or 5 readings every single second, but your processor was only set up to read the gyro at 1 hertz, once a second. If you operate the buffer and bypass mode, then the processor is only going to read every fifth sensor reading, and the rest of them are going to get thrown out. And if you're okay with reading the gyro at 1 hertz, this is perfectly fine. I mean, there's a reason why this is the default setting. However, if you want every single reading that the gyro produces, then you have two options. You can either speed up the rate at which the processor reads the gyro, or you can save those gyro readings in the buffer. So now let's talk about which modes the buffer has. In FIFO mode, the gyro data is saved in the buffer until all 32 slots have been filled, or until you clear out the buffer. The thing to note about FIFO mode, though, is that once the buffer is full, it can no longer save any more information. However, so that doesn't happen to you, the user can set a watermark interrupt flag that will send a signal to the processor telling it that the buffer is at the watermark, and so wake up and read all the information at once. Then you can clear the buffer and start the process over again. But remember, in FIFO mode, the buffer is always the first 32 readings, and once it's full, it stops recording data. In stream mode, the buffer will fill up, just like in FIFO mode. However, once the buffer is full, it's going to start pushing out the old information to make room for the new. So in this case, the buffer is always the last 32 readings. Again, in this mode, you can also set a watermark to wake up your processor and have it read all of the data in the buffer. In bypass to stream mode and stream to FIFO mode, they just allow you to switch between the two modes using a trigger event. Now, I'm not going to spend any time talking about these two different modes in detail, but if you are interested, you can read all about them in the datasheet. All right, so what does all this buffer talk mean to you as the system designer? Well, the buffer is a nice feature because it allows you to access all of the gyro data without having to read every value at every sample time. This will save you processing power and speed if necessary. The downside, though, is that you won't be getting all of your gyro readings real time, which might be a problem if you're trying to design a system that has to act real time to angular velocity inputs. In the car that I'm building, I don't need fast updates in my gyro reading, but I do need them real time. So that's why I'm going to operate my gyro in bypass mode, which is the default, so I don't have to set anything differently. All right, let's get back to the data sheet now. Now, in the next few sections, the data sheet explains all five modes of the buffer in detail. So if you need to know a little bit more about each one before selecting one, you can read it here. Now, I'm going to skip over the digital interfaces section because, again, the min IMU 9 takes care of this for us and so we'd be better off reading the digital interface to that board instead. But if you want to read about all the nitty-gritty details of either the SPI or I2C bus, then you can get all of that information here. And this brings us to a very important section of the datasheet, the output register mapping. There are a number of 8-bit registers in the gyro, and table 17 gives you an overview of all of them. The type column tells you whether something is read-only, like the Who Am I register, or read and writable, like Control Register 1. And this table also provides you with the default value for each of these registers. Of course, except for the ones that are labeled output, since they get overwritten each sample time. So there's no default value. The registers that are writable are the ones that configure the gyro to select the different operating modes, output rates, and filters that we talked about earlier. Each of these registers are described in detail in the sections below. However, I'm just going to talk about a few of the control registers so you have an idea of how to read the section and how you can write to the registers to change the default settings of the gyro. Let's start with control register 1. You can see from table 19 that this is an 8-bit register. And you can also see that the first four bits, DR1, DR0, BW1, and BW0, select the output data rate and the cutoff frequency for the digital low-pass filter. Now later on I'll show you a register that you can write to to bypass the low-pass filter if you don't want it, but you still need to specify a cutoff frequency here. The cutoff frequency for a digital low-pass filter is very similar to the cutoff frequency for an analog low-pass filter, which is sometimes called the corner frequency. Essentially, all input frequencies higher than this value are attenuated in some manner. They aren't removed completely, 
but they're just a lower amplitude than they would be without the filter. But as a quick estimate, you can really just think of the cutoff frequency like this. Only inputs with lower frequencies than the cutoff will make it through the sensor. The others will be blocked. So when you're selecting a cutoff frequency, keep in mind which frequencies you want your sensor to respond to and select the cutoff appropriately. The lower you can make the cutoff frequency, the less high frequency noise will enter your system. All right, the last four bits set the power down mode and toggle the three different axes on or off. So for example, if you wanted to run this gyro at 190 Hz output rate with a cutoff frequency of 50 Hz, you'd want to set DR, or the first two bits, to 01 and BW, or the next two bits, to 10. And then if you wanted to run in normal mode, you'd set the fifth bit to a 1, and then if you wanted to run with all three axes operating, then the last three bits would also be 1. Control register 2 is where you would configure the digital high pass filter if you wanted to use it. Notice that each of these registers have default values, and this one's defaulted off. So you don't need to set anything for this register if you're happy with the default value. You probably won't use this high pass filter very often, but it is available if you wanted to set up, say, a complementary filter. A complementary filter blends the high frequency content of one sensor with the low frequency content of another sensor. And so if you wanted to only use the high frequency content of this gyro, you could set up the high pass filter internally. Then you'd put a low pass filter on a different sensor and you would combine them together. Table 26 shows you the various high pass filter cutoff frequencies based on the output data rate that you've chosen. Now the cutoff frequency here is opposite of the low pass filter. In the high pass filter, all input frequencies slower than the cutoff frequency get attenuated and all of them higher than the cutoff frequency are passed through. Control register three is where you can configure the different interrupt pins on the device. And control register 4 is where you can set the full scale values for the gyro, among other things. And finally, control register 5 enables and disables the FIFO buffer, the digital high pass filter, and the digital low pass filter. And you do that through a combination of this H pin and the output select bits. And you can see how in figure 18. By toggling H pin between a 0 and a 1, you are either bypassing or using the high pass filter. And then by selecting the appropriate output select bits, you're either using some combination of the high pass filter and low pass filter or bypassing them all completely. Okay, you can read through the rest of these register descriptions in the data sheet, and you can learn what that register sets and which values you need to send in order to set it. But the idea is that you learn what the gyro is capable of doing from the sections of the data sheet at the beginning. Then you figure out how you want to operate the gyro based on your particular application. Then you can read the register description section and determine what values you need to write so that the gyro operates the way you intend it to. Understanding the data sheet is really important in order for you to get the most out of your sensor and to make sure that it's going to work for your particular application. Now the last thing I want to show you real quick is that writing new values to the register is easy with the L3GD20 Arduino library. And you can find this directly on the Pololu website. It provides you with the function write reg for write register and the name of each register. So you can call that keyword and set the registers any way you wish. So play around with setting the parameters in the gyro and watch how the output is affected. I think ultimately that's really one of the best ways to understand your gyro, is just get out there and play around with it and see how it behaves. So that's pretty much all I wanted to cover in how to read a gyro datasheet. Obviously there's a lot more stuff that we could cover, but I think I pretty much hit all of the highlights uh, and definitely the stuff that we're going to be using over the next couple videos as we build up the model for our Zumo robots so that we can design the control system for it. So in the next couple of videos, we're going to use the information from the data sheet, as well as some of the information that we're going to record directly from the gyro in order to develop a nonlinear model of this gyro, then ultimately a model of the entire system, and then we'll be able to design our control system from there. So I hope you guys stay with me through this whole process. If you guys have any questions on anything I've said in this video or any of the other past videos, uh, go ahead and leave a comment down below, and I'll do my best to uh, try to answer it for you guys. Don't forget to subscribe so that you guys don't miss any future videos, and as always, thanks for watching.